Sir Winston Churchill, the greatest Englishman of our time. The man who made history, who wrote history, is now himself part of history. Sir Winston was born into politics. At the siege of Sydney Street in 1911, he could not resist as Home Secretary personally directing the roundup of a group of anarchists in London's East End. 1914, the First World War. And for Churchill, a tremendous challenge. He was the man who, as First Lord of the Admiralty, recreated and mobilized the fleet, but whose restless energy made him political enemies as well as friends. Yet, in spite of the fierce controversy over Gallipoli, he emerged from the war in 1918 in the front rank of British political life. Here he is with King George V, Mr Lloyd George and Lord Curzon in 1921. He goes to Paris to attend a disarmament conference. But already he had detected the dangers that were stirring in that uneasy Europe of the early 1930s. His was the unpopular voice warning the world that Germany was rearming, that Britain and the Commonwealth were not fully prepared. 1939, for the second time in his life, Churchill sees the secure world of his youth go up in flames. His hour had come. All that had gone before seemed but a preparation for this, the moment when he became the defiant, unconquerable voice of Britain and the free world. As the uh, Nazis look out tonight from their blatant, clattering, panoplied Germany, they cannot find one single friendly eye in the whole circumference of the globe. Not one. The great English-speaking republic across the Atlantic Ocean makes no secret of its sympathies, or I may add, of its self-questionings. And uh, the United States translates these sentiments into action of a character which anyone may judge for himself. In the winter of 1939, when the German pocket battleship Graf Spee came to her dramatic end in the South Atlantic, Churchill was first Lord of the Admiralty and the symbol of Britain's will to win. Churchill it was who welcomed the victors home. And at the banquet at Guildhall, he spoke these words that stirred the hearts of his countrymen. The brilliant sea fight, which uh, Admiral Harwood conceived and which <coughs> you executed takes its place in our naval annals and I may add that in a dark, cold winter it warmed the cockles of the British heart. But his work as First Lord of the Admiralty was only the preparation. In May 1940, the German fury swept over France and the Low Countries. Churchill became Prime Minister. I felt, he wrote, as if I were walking with destiny. The free world had need of his fire and courage. The Allies were driven towards the sea at Dunkirk. France fell. Britain stood alone. The Germans were only 22 miles away, across the Straits of Dover. Guns, tanks, rifles, all had been lost. But Churchill, even then, was laying the foundations of ultimate victory. He found the art of forging words themselves into the weapons we needed. Let us therefore brace ourselves to our duty. And so bear ourselves that if the British Empire and its Commonwealth last for a thousand years, men will still say, this 
was their silent hour. Millions drew courage and hope from that voice. Millions waited for it as the few fought to save the free world. They signed the sky with the white crisscross trails of their victory. 15,000 feet above the quiet countryside of southern Britain. Never in the field of human conflict when so much owed by so many to so few. Defeated by day, the Germans attacked by night. Britain faced the agony of the Blitz. Again, that voice rallied men to resist. We will have no truce or parley with you or the grisly gang who work your wicked will. You do your worst. And we will do our best. The Germans bombed city after city, but they dared not risk that short channel crossing to invade Churchill's England. He gave thanks at St. Paul's that the island fortress had held firm. Now came the first of his historic wartime journeys. In 1941, he sailed across the Atlantic in the Prince of Wales to meet the President of the United States in a quiet bay on the coast of Newfoundland. He greets his great friend and partner, President Roosevelt. America, not yet at war, is making herself the arsenal of democracy. Give us the tools and we will finish the job. The American alliance was firmly based on his personal friendship with the president and on his own affection for the United States of America. And soon, for the first time, a British prime minister addressed a joint session of Congress. I cannot help but reflecting that if my father had been uh, American and my mother British <coughs> instead of the other way around, uh, I might have got here on my own. <laughs> he went north to speak to the Canadian Parliament at Ottawa. His speeches had now become far more than formal oratory. They were among the most powerful of the Allies' war weapons. The peoples of the British Empire may love peace. They do not seek the lands or wealth of any country. But they are a tough and hardy lot. We have not journeyed all this way across the centuries, across the oceans, across the mountains, across the prairies, because we are made of sugar candy. He reminded the millions listening throughout the world of his words to the tottering French government back in 1940. When I warned them that Britain would fight on alone, whatever they did, their generals told their prime minister and his divided cabinet, in three weeks, England will have a neck run like a chicken. Some chicken. <laughs> Some neck. <laughs> the war had now reached its most critical stage. Hitler was pushing deep into Soviet Russia. Churchill, flying back from America, could not resist taking a turn at the controls. In August 1942, he met Stalin in Moscow, as the German offensive faltered around Stalingrad. Now, at last, the tide had turned. 
In the desert, Churchill saw the men who, under General Montgomery, were soon to win the victory at El Alamein. The advance swept on to Tripoli, and then at Tunis came the first of the victory parades. The darkest days of the war were over. General Alexander reported the Germans eliminated from North Africa and ended his telegram, I now await your further instructions. The Allies could advance to the liberation of Europe itself. And when once again Churchill addressed the United States Congress, he had a triumphant message to give. The African war is over. Mussolini's African Empire and Corporal Hitler's strategy are alike exploding. June the 6th, 1944. The Allied forces successfully landed on the soil of France. And one of the most welcome of visitors, just six days later, was the Prime Minister. And nothing could have given him more satisfaction than to stand at last amid the broken defences of the Siegfried Line. He had already seen the liberation of the great city of Paris. He had never despaired of it, even in the dark days of 1940. When that day dawns, and dawn it will, the soul of France will turn with comprehension and with kindness to those Frenchmen and French women, wherever they may be who in the darkest hour did not despair of the Republic. With General de Gaulle, he rode in triumph through the city. March 1945, Churchill crossed the Rhine. And then, a few weeks later, on May the 8th, he made this announcement. Hostilities will end officially at one minute after midnight tonight, Tuesday, the 8th of May. Victory Parade in London in June 1946. Churchill sits beside his successor, Britain's new Prime Minister, then Mr. Attlee. Though for a moment the workings of the democracy he cherished had taken power from him, Churchill still held the warm personal affection of the man in the street. Even out of office, this man of so many talents never lost his warm human gusto for the smaller pleasures of life. He found new delight in his painting. His canvases went on exhibition in the world's great cities. The historian of Marlborough and the First World War took up his pen again to write the history of the Second World War and of the English-speaking peoples. The great statesman who had upheld all Britain by his example could sit quietly in his garden at Chartwell in Kent, and where the hands that had controlled the destiny of the world feed his friends the birds. He goes to a family occasion at his parish church at Westrum for the christening of his fifth grandchild, the son of Mr. and Mrs. Christopher Soames. The 1951 election brought the old warrior back into power at the age of 76. At Chartwell, he receives the Premier of France, Mr. Mondes France. Then, in 1952, came the death of King George VI, and the young Queen flew back from Africa. So to the splendours of the coronation. So Winston and Lady Churchill drove in their coronation robes to Westminster Abbey. As he walked in the procession to the great west door, he seemed the embodiment of all the glories, trials and triumphs 
of our long history. The garter ceremony at Windsor Castle. Now he had been knighted. The honours were thick upon him. Sir Winston Leonard, Spencer Churchill, Knight of the Most Noble Order of the Garter, one of Her Majesty's Privy Councillors, Member of the Order of Merit, Companion of Honour, Elder Brother of Trinity House, Warden of the Cinque Ports, and Member of Parliament. Member of Parliament. Of all the honours that had been bestowed on him, he was proudest of the fact that from 1900, the beginning of this century, he had sat in the British House of Commons. Now, on his 80th birthday, he was still Prime Minister, and members of both houses united to offer him a token of their profound admiration and affection. He came down the long stairway that leads to the ancient Hall of Westminster, where he was to be presented with his portrait painted by Graham Sutherland. presented the picture. The portrait is a remarkable example of modern art. combines force and candor. <laughs> These are qualities which no active member of either house can do without or should fear to meet. <laughs> I'm now nearing the end of my journey. I hope I still have some services to render. However that may be, and whatever may befall, I am sure I shall never forget the emotions of this day or be able fully to express my gratitude to those colleagues and companions with whom I have lived my life for this wonderful honor they have done me. through his life, Sir Winston had the devoted support of a remarkable woman. In 1908, he had married Miss Clementine Hosier. Who can assess what he, and we too, owe to her help and support, and to her insight into his character? last years, Sir Winston always made a special effort to go to his old school Harrow on speech day. The torch which had blazed so brightly was being handed on. In the century yet to come, many a boy of today would be able to tell his grandchildren, I saw Churchill. possible honours were his, but his greatest memorial is surely this, that as long as men cherish freedom, he will be remembered.